Tell us a joke. Share us. Show us your snakes. Video. Do you have any snakes caught? Yes. Uh, we. You no, know, I need an update on your snake crawling. So, um, so if you hadn't heard, I moved. So I'm no longer in oh, the neighborhood where all. Well, well. But here's my thing. So I back right up to the Cleveland National Forest now. So now I just have to wait for the snakes to actually come in my yard. Um, and because I don't know my neighbors well enough, and I haven't gone around to everyone and said, "Hey, I'm the snake guy. Can you call me?" When you have snakes in your yard? Like, that might sound a little weird if you did. Yeah, anyways. I decided like I'm gonna wait a little bit before I do that. So. Oh but um, I think since I spoke to everyone last on my snakes, I got my first snake bite, which was super exciting. Yeah. Oh, such a weirdo. Wait, what kind of snake? Uh, it was a coach whip, a red racer. So not nothing poisonous or anything. But I'd been watching videos of people getting bit by snakes and they were super like fine with it. So I said, I just need to like have it happen to me so I know that I'm okay. So um, I got called to a house and they knew where the snake was. It was underneath the trash can. And I used my claw and I could only really get a little bit on its tail. And it like the coach whips are super strong and fast. So it was like pulling really hard. I'm like, I just need to pick it up. So I reached down and picked up its tail and he swung his body up and he just grabbed onto my index finger and oh. just like wouldn't like go and just started gnawing. It was just like, oh. Oh, like it was a huge toy. And the people that lived there were like watching and I'm, you know, they're like, oh my God. And I'm like, oh, you silly snake. What are you doing? Like, you know, I was just totally <laughs> fine with it. So it was good. Right. When I came home, I, you know, maybe later I'll show photos and, uh, you know, show you guys later. It was crazy. huge, just little nut drops coming yeah. out. Like it was fine. So at your new home, backed up to the National Forest, is there any other like animals or reptiles that you'll be taking on as a challenge? Well, actually, so right now, a friend of ours gave a, a hummingbird feeder as a housewarming gift. And I've right now there's this red hummingbird that um, has taken possession of it and literally sits in a tree watching. And anytime another hummingbird comes over, dive bombs it, you can hear it. Like you physically hear the sound of just a hummingbird like smacking into another hummingbird. So it provides like endless entertainment. We just sit in the backyard, kids are in the pool and I just watch like hummingbirds like fight it out over that. Hummingbirds water. are very territorial. Yeah, we have yes. them all around our house. Yeah, it was crazy. It was crazy. All right, Rudy, I think I've riffed enough. We could probably get going. What do you think? I think we're good. Okay. All right, everyone. Well, hey, super excited to have everyone uh, for today's uh, training class on lead, which, you know, I didn't ever quite figure out why I'm doing this training when both Paul and Candace actually are accredited lead professionals. But that's okay. Let's have well, the guy who's not the accredited Paul's professional. Paul's more updated. Um, I'm behind. So Paul should actually be presenting this. <laughs> <laughs> this there you go. go right ahead with it. He said, ask Vince. <laughs> no, no. And it's totally, totally fine. And we will talk a little bit about why I chose not to become a accredited professional. We will certainly get into that. There are going to be points here where I am going to be going... But there's facts. There'll be lots of facts, but we will also hear Vince's opinion. So okay. his opinion doesn't necessarily rep represent the opinions of Walters and Wolf, but you know, we'll get into that. All right. Oh, I got to just use my mouse to advance the slide. Okay. So starting out at a, and um, just to confirm, you guys do see my slides, correct? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So I mean, starting out, what is lead? So the word LEAD stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Um, it's a, it, what it is is a green building certification program. It's today uh, run and managed by the US Green Building Council. When it originally started, and we'll talk a little bit of history, it was the National Resources Defense Council that was doing it. Um, you know, what it is at its core, it's a rating system for the design, construction, and today, operation and maintenance of green buildings, homes, neighborhoods, even cities can apply to get a LEED certification. Um, the aim is to help those building owners and operators be environmentally responsible and use resources efficiently. You know, now why, do, why would a building owner want to go through this process and do all of these things? LEED says, what they bill it as is, look, if you make a LEED building in the long run, you will save money. You're going to have a more energy efficient building. 
Um, um, you're going to have just an environmentally friendly building. You're going to have a building that the occupants are going to be happier with. Um, these are all the reasons that LEED encourages you know, buildings to go and get LEED certification. At the same time, we have a lot of um, cities and even states that encourage buildings to become LEED certified. Um, through some of it's mandatory, some of it maybe they get tax credits back. So there's a lot of things going on. Now I will say this, um, since the times LEED's been around and researchers have gone back and looked at are all the things that were promised true? Not so much. Um, it turns out in practice, they use just about the same amount of energy as non-LEED buildings and um, the people in them they're not any happier than people in non-LEED buildings. So um, those are some of the uh, criticisms pointed at LEED today, but it is still very much around. I do think it's decreasing a bit. I don't know, I kind of wanted to get a feel from the room here. I mean, are you still seeing LEED on all of your projects or do you have projects that aren't doing it? Yes. You still see it? It's just yes, not as- all like, of them. It's not okay. as- uh, it doesn't seem as critical or as important as it used to a couple of years ago. You do yeah. see like it, it being required and they want the documentation, but it's not as like, we have to meet this, this lead uh, platinum right. and you guys need to do everything you can to meet that. And as we all know, the curtain wall industry doesn't really contribute much to the lead points. Yes. And we will certainly get into just how little we actually do contribute. Um, yeah. And I think that part of the reason that we've seen some of that fall off, or at least the, you know, the fall off on the high pressure side of it is, you know, in the beginning of lead, no one really knew how rigorous, um, lead themselves would be. I mean, how much monitoring they would do, how much auditing they would do of the data. I mean, what we found out is really, they don't do a lot. It is very much um, an on your honor type system. And I think that that takes a little bit of the emphasis off that people have of wanting to, um, you know, make sure everything is done correctly and all the I's dotted. Uh, so history of it. So as I mentioned, development started actually 27 years ago, back in 1993, um, with the pilot version launching in 1998. That was LEED, new construction version 1.0. Um, in 2005, they launched uh, LEED version 2.0. LEED 2009 then was launched in 2009, surprisingly, that we went ahead and had 2009 in 2009. But um, they did previously name that one version three. Uh, LEED 4.0 launched in 2013. And that's primarily when we, what the stuff we look at today is going to be based upon version four. There was a window from 2013 to 2016 where projects could choose which version of LEED they wanted to follow, but any project that got registered after October 31st of 2016 all needed to be LEED version four. Um, the current version technically is 4.1 with minor tweaks. The interesting thing that we will see when I talked with a couple PMs and actually had them give me the packets that they're still ending up submitting and what they're receiving from the customer, a lot of those forms are still very based upon that version three, the lead 2009. The reason is, is that the information needed, it's still the same. It's not different than what we had to provide them before, but technically it's going into different categories than it did previously. Any point along the way, if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. We will have a question and answer period at the end of the class. So when we're talking about LEED, what kinds of different buildings does LEED version 4.1 look at? And I do that buildings, you know, because it's really different things they look at, not really buildings. So most everything we do falls under building design and construction, right? New construction in particular all falls under building design and construction. LEED also has a interior design and construction arm this would apply a little bit with like what SPD does and TI work, but a lot of it is more focused on like remodels of existing buildings. So not something we get into. Um, lead for operations and maintenance focuses on the actual running of the building. So let's say you had a building that was 
30 years old, right? So it was never a lead building, but you want to find a way to get lead certification. Operations and maintenance is a path that that building could take. Um, there's basically ways that they operate, ways they keep up the equipment, what they do to maintain that building that could allow an older building to still get some type of lead certification. It's not the most common building design one, which we are dealing with, but it's an operation maintenance of something. Um, then we have residential, which is housing, um, all you know, from single family homes to apartment buildings to condos fall in the residential lead category. Then we have the cities and communities um, where whole cities can actually get lead certification. Washington DC was the first city to get um, certification as an entire city. And then we have recertification, which because it wasn't good enough that you got lead when you first opened up, let me recertify it that I'm still lead uh, 10 years down the road. Yeah. So side note, this is all for the money. It's all a money making scheme. That's exactly what we're doing here. So we just fill out paperwork so someone else can make money off of it. All right, so what we're primarily doing is building design and construction. But even within that, then we have that breakdown. Uh, the one that we're probably familiar most with is new construction and major renovations. Um, we also do a lot of the core and shell development. They do have separate, and, and in most cases, these all look at the same things. They just might have a slightly different emphasis on each of them. So they have schools, retail, data centers, warehouse distribution centers, hospitality, and finally healthcare. These are all like sub segments within building design and construction, which can vary a bit. Cause you think about like a data center, especially with as much power that a data center uses, they have slightly different criteria on that compared to like a school, right? So just little changes on each one of these. But again, the majority of what we do really falls under that new construction, major renovation, core and shell development. So within building design and construction, I mean, how does this actually work? You've got a series of basically 110 possible points that a project can get. Um, and it's broken down to, and we're going to go through each of these in, you know, closer look, but integrative processes, location, and, you know, these are the total points available in each of them. So integrative processes, one point possible in that whole section. Location, transportation, 16. Sustainable sites, 10. Water efficiency, 11. Energy and atmosphere, 33. That's the big one. Materials and resources, 13. And that's the one we'll spend more time on in particular because that's really one of the only spots that we have an impact. And then environmental, indoor environmental quality, 16. Then you've got a possible 10 bonus points for innovation, for there and then regional priority. Um, credits that are based more specifically around what's important in the region of that building. So you've got 110 possible, but what do you actually need to pass? Well, if all you're going for is lead certification, 40 to 49, like, I mean, so the bar is pretty low. Like if you get 40 points out of 110, like you get a sticker, so. But if you want that silver sticker, you've got to get in the 50s, uh, lead gold, 60 to 79, and then platinum, anything over 80. So if the building can get over 80, they get platinum. But if you get half that, you still got certified as a, as a lead building. So let's talk for a minute about each of these separate um, categories that they had. So integrated processes, this was only worth that one point. Um, this point is for them early on in the process using analysis to um, help design the building. Basically, it says, hey, we give you a point if you make um, designing this building a lead building a priority from day one, rather than trying to do it after the fact, that it's all built into the basis of design. Um, location and transportation. So just kind of going through these, you know, there's nine points for lead for neighborhood development location. Uh, sensitive land protection gets a point, high priority site, two points, surrounding density and diverse use is a point, access to quality transit, two points, bicycle facilities, a point, reduced parking, a point, electric vehicles, a point. Now, I'm not going to go into any of these in detail unless during the question and answer or right now someone's like, I really want to know about that one. That we can because 
none of these have anything to do with us at all either passively or directly. We're gonna talk about that a lot as we go through some of these because there are a lot of points that I, you know, we passively contribute to, meaning yes, our systems are what's helping that point get there, but it's nothing that we're actually truly doing or deciding, it's all based upon the design of the building and how the architect ultimately designed their building. Uh, sustainable sites. So a point for site assessment, a point for protect or restore habitat, a point for open spaces, two points for rainwater management, a point for heat island reduction, point for light pollution reduction, point for place of respite, and point for direct exterior access. Again, nothing on here has anything to do with us or what we would do. Uh, water efficiency, there's some points here. Outdoor water reduction, a point. Seven points for indoor water use reduction, two for a cooling tower water use, one for water metering. And just to catch the theme, none of these have anything to do with Walters and Wolf. So this goes back to why I never got my you know, LEED um, personal certification as either a green associate or a LEED AP. Um, it, you know, I was going to spend all my time learning about uh, indoor water use reduction and how to get those seven points, which didn't actually apply to anything we we're doing. I chose instead just to, on my own, focus on the things that affect Walters and Wolf, which now we're at least partially getting into. So next up was that energy and atmosphere. This is really where the bulk of the points are. Um, you know, this whole category has 33 points. So if you ace this, you're only seven points away from getting um, LEED certified. Enhanced commissioning six points. The big one, the big daddy that they need, the optimized energy performance, 20 points. Advanced energy metering, one point. Grid harmonization, two. Renewable energy, five. Enhanced refrigerant management, one. So that optimized energy performance, this is one that we do contribute to, but we are passively contributing, right? So this is where glass type would come into account, right? You know, they're trying out there, the optimizing energy performance is looking for the building designers to design a building that utilizes less energy than a set performance benchmark. The more they can come in under that benchmark, the more points they get. So it's not a checkbox type question where they automatically get all 20 points, but the better performing the building, the more of those points they ultimately get, right? So. It's, it's a two-sided thing. I mean, you're going to get it, one, by physically using electricity, making sure, you know, and just energy in general, making sure that you're using devices in the building that are efficient. But you're also going to get it by designing a building that doesn't need those things, right? So again, when we choose to spend the money, and when I say we, the building owner, money on higher performing glass, higher performing facades, bleh, um, insulation, you know, better insulation, all those things, when they can make a better envelope, um, you know, there, that helps contribute as they're running those points. So again, a lot of that's glass selection, right? we only have a, a small contribution with our own system. So you could say that our new W75 next gen, which we haven't gotten to the point of doing NFRC modeling on yet, but we believe it'll perform better ultimately we are contributing and helping with that optimized energy performance. All right, materials and resources. Now we're finally at the ones where we are directly related. But even here, there's only a couple of them. So we've, and, and I will get into the couple that are more specific and we'll also, um, you know, talk about the process that we need to do of what's the physical work we actually do here. So building life cycle impact reduction, five points. Um, this, that one's really about reusing existing buildings. So um, not much there. Building product disclosure and opt optimization and environmental product building uh, worth two points. Building product disclosure and optimization sourcing, two points. This is the one that we really are involved with. So, and it's changed. This is, was a change in wording from that old version three to the version four. And some of you may have noticed that because it used to be called like MR credit four and it was recycled content. Now they're calling it sourcing. It's 
partially, and we'll get into this, like it's partially about is it recycled, but there's other ways that that can be better sourced that they'll give points to. Um, building product disclosure and optimi optimization material, the physical type of material. Um, uh, then we have source reduction of things like mercury, source reduction of lead, cadmium, copper, um, points for furniture and medical furnishings to not have any uh, poisons in it, design for flexibility, a point, and construction and demolition waste management, two points. So when the GC says, hey, we've got dedicated bins, this type of trash goes here, this type, type of recycled material goes here, that's them trying to get those two points for construction and demolition waste management. And the last section that we also partially contribute to here, in, uh, the indoor environmental quality. We've got enhanced indoor air quality strategies, two points. Low emitting materials, three. Uh, construction indoor air quality management, one. Indoor air quality assessment, two. Thermal comfort, one. Interior lighting, one. Daylight, two. Quality views, two. Acoustic performance, two. A lot of these we contribute to passively, right? Acoustic performance, views, daylight, those are all things that our systems do in terms of actually letting light in. Um, having operable windows that allow the flow of uh, air from outside to inside the building. All things that we contribute, none that we're um, directly doing, right? It's all passive through the design of the building by the architect and the owner. The one though that we always have to report on is that low emitting materials and primarily, and we'll get into this more with our sealants, right? So the whole concept here, I think most people are aware, when you buy a new car and you get that new car smell, what are you really getting? You're really getting all of the adhesives and other things that went into making that car off gassing and giving you cancer. So yes, you want to breathe in very deeply on your new car so that you're getting all of those um, chemicals as they off gas. The goal here with LEED was like, hey, let's not have our buildings do that. So, you know, let's make sure that the materials that are getting applied in the building, and when we say applied, I always think of it as in terms of things that are wet. It's the paints, it's the sealants, it's the adhesives, that all those things that are, that are used in constructing the building meet certain levels. And we'll, we'll get into the specifics of what we need there. Uh, and then innovation, possible six points, you get five for being in innovative, having something very different or unique on the building. You built a building using entirely plastic water bottles. Like good, I actually saw that one, like it was somewhere in Asia. They use recycled water bottles to build the entire building. That'd be innovative. Uh, and then you get a point for a lead accredited professional being on the project. And then regional priority. So again, this is where the, these are existing points that we already talked on that you're getting an extra point because it's important to that area. So this list that we're looking at right here, this is the list for uh, Fremont, California. So in Fremont, California, the regional group of the US Green Building Council has said, optimize energy performance, rainwater management, access to quality transit, uh, sourcing raw materials, outdoor water use reduction, and indoor water use reduction. Those are the six hot button items that they want to reward an additional point to for uh, achieving these. You know, if I gave the list for Southern California or for Las Vegas, it would probably be similar to this, right? Uh, but my, some might change. Uh, Las Vegas as a, as a desert, you can imagine very much more focused on things all surrounding water use and water reduction. So now let's get into those couple points that we actually do matter. And these are the ones that we're actually submitting documentation on. So uh, sourcing, the intent of this sourcing uh, points to encourage the use of products and materials for which life cycle information is available and that have environmentally, economically, and socially preferable life cycle impacts to reward project teams for selecting products verified to have an exacted or sourced uh, in a responsible manner. That's from the lead handbook, what the intent of this is. Um, <clears throat> and they give a couple different ways to do it. So way one, use products sourced from at least three different manufacturers that meet at least one of the responsible sourcing and 
extraction criteria below for at least 20% uh, by cost of the total value of permanently installed building products. And technically these next one are these different ways to meet it. So one, use products sourced from at least five different manufacturers uh, that meet at least one of the responsible sourcing and extraction criteria below. Oh, I, I see what I'm saying wrong. So first one, you get 20% of the building this way, it's a point. 40%, you get two points. My next slide has the source ways that you can get this. So they're looking for products that meet one of these five categories. The first would be extended producer responsibility. That doesn't apply to us. Extended re producer responsibility is when you buy tires and you pay an extra uh, fee to have those tires at the end of its life cycle responsibly recycled, that's extended producer responsibility. It's the manufacturer saying that at the end of this life cycle, I'm going to take this back and properly dispose of it. Um, E-waste is another example of that. Again, tires, mattresses, things like that, not curtain walls. Um, Bio-based materials, using materials that would be, um, again, bio-based. So this is about, you know, if you think about things like, you know, furniture is being built out of, and again, bio-based materials, not necessarily wood, because that's another one. But if you've had innovative ways of using, you know, corn or other plant materials, it's, it's anything but animal materials. You don't get credit for using leather, which I guess, fine, let's keep the cows happy. But um, any other biomass materials, if you can build a building out of it, you get credit for it. Wood products, using renewable wood products in it gets you the credit. Uh, material reuse, if you're reusing something from another building or it just has been used before and you're putting it in to, to a new life cycle, you get credit. None of those apply to us. The one that applies to us and what they're looking for, that recycled content. Uh, products meeting recycled content criteria are valued at 100% of their cost for the purposes of credit achievement calculation. Recycled content is the sum of post-consumer recycled content plus one half of the pre-consumer recycled content based on weight. Uh, and then you multiply those by the cost of assembly to determine the recycled content value. So let's talk about those words for a second, just so we're clear on those. Post-consumer versus pre-consumer. When you recycle an aluminum can, that's post-consumer, right? So that can had its purpose, had material in it, went to the consumer, the consumer consumed it, now it's being recycled, that's post-consumer. When the scrap aluminum from Western gets melted down and reused because it didn't extrude correctly, that's pre-consumer, right? So it's all about when in the process did that material get recycled? Did it make it to the customer and get used or was it recycled before it actually left you know, the facility, if you will, okay? So they give more credit if it is post-consumer, you only get one half credit if it was um, you know, pre-consumer. Now, where we used to have an entirely separate point, right? Now it was material credit five that talked about where it came from, it's all actually rolled into the same two points that we were talking about. What we're really saying is that we have even less value in the lead process now. Everything we do is all about them getting two points. Because now what they've said is, hey, of all those things we just talked about on the last slide, which we go back to, you know, the extended producer responsibility, bio-based materials, wood products, material reuse, recycled content, of all those things, if you could get those, and have them come within 100 miles of the product site that they're extracted, manufactured, and purchased within 100 miles of the project site, you get twice their value to contribute up to a maximum of 200%. But again, it's still only out of that possible two points, right? So this is where we've, we've kind of lost our value in, in lead because they rolled that all into one. Now, the key thing here to always think about is that it, you, they are looking for materials to be extracted, manufactured, and purchased. You know, there's a lot of times that we would see manufacturers 
especially back in the day, be like, oh, we meet this quality because we fabricate it here. But it's like, yeah, but your raw materials didn't come from here. Your raw materials came from someplace entirely different. It's the whole product needs to have been sourced within that 100 miles, which makes it very difficult to actually, um, for us, for any of our materials to find things that actually fit into that classification. Oh, I lost my mouse. There we go. Now, but we do have a new one and I wanna to touch on this for sure and make sure that we're doing this correctly. So we do have the building, this is a separate two points, building product disclosure and optimization environmental product declarations. The intent to encourage the use of products and materials for which life cycle information is available and have environmentally, economically, and socially preferable life cycle impacts. To reward project teams for selecting products from manufacturers who have verified improved environmental life cycle impacts. So I have seen, and we're gonna look at an example of this in a little bit. Um, today, when you're getting your information from the vendors and talking to Heather, we're gonna be putting this up on the wiki. The aluminum industry has created a environmental product declaration for thermally broken aluminum. Um, again, we'll look at the document, but basically it's a document that walks through what the production and total life cycle, cradle to gate, meaning from its source to the point that it's fully implemented, they created one of these documents. So when we submit that to the customer, they can use that to help them get points for the environmental product disclosure. Um, there's not much else that we produce to my knowledge that has the environmental product disclosures because it's quite a bit of work. I mean, they're long documents, a lot goes into them. So it really would fall on all of our vendors to do it. It's not something that comes from us. And to date, you don't get much of it. I think you get a lot more when you're starting to get into electrical systems and, and things like that. Again, the other one here, the low emitting materials. This is the one that we directly contribute to and we have to send documentation. Again, they're trying to keep it that you have for adhesives and sealants that we're 75% of all adhesives and sealants meet VOC emissions and 100% VOC content evaluation. Again, smelling things, that new car smell is actually bad for you, right? We're trying to keep things to low admit. Um, today, and anyone correct me if I'm wrong on this, I mean, when, when LEED first came out and we were doing this, there was a period where we were having an issue with Dow products. It wasn't with the actual sealant, it was actually with the primers the primers exceeded the content area, but I, um, Dow may change their formulations. And I think today we're totally fine with that. Now, the other spot that we technically are usually a little sideways on, just that we're clear on this, is our touch-up paint. And Heather, maybe you can speak to this because if, if anything has changed, but our touch-up paints that we get do not meet the requirements. Correct, Heather? Correct. They don't meet them. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is, I'm glad we're recording this. Yeah. This is why we don't submit anything about our touch of pain. Just, you know, it's just like we, it's don't ask, don't tell type of situation there because any of our aerosol products, those do not meet VOC limits. So we don't bring it up. Um, I've only run into probably once ever that someone even asked about it. I don't know if any of you from your personal experiences has had anyone ask you about the touch-up paints and the VOCs? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay, so that's good. We'll just continue down that path and no one does anything. Just submit your stuff for Dow and we'll be good. Now, let me go ahead and pull up and let's actually look at what it is that we have to give to the customer. So I'm gonna stop sharing that presentation and switch over one second because I've got some sample uh, submittals available here.
Okay, are you all seeing my screen correctly? Just gotta move it, move like all of the, all your faces right in front of it. It was super weird there. So um, we're gonna look at two examples of the submittal and just talk through the things that are in here and what we're, what we're doing. So um, like I mentioned, even though we've switched over to version four, we're still seeing a lot of people ask for the information in the old format. So this is a project that, you know, again, any project that was registered after October 31st, 2016, with technically falls under version four. Now, again, for us, that really doesn't matter. We're just supplying the data. The people that are having to put it in are, you know, the consultants and all those other people that, again, where all the money on this thing is actually going to, those are the people that actually have to do the work and put it in. But so this is a project that's ongoing. We we're just in the field on it now, and it's still centered around that old way of doing it. It's still calling it material and resources credit four and local resources credit five. So I'm sure you've all seen these. We fill out, generally the customer is gonna give you a form in their format that they want you to fill out where we're listing out our materials and our material cost. Material cost you're gonna get from your G703, right? It's, this isn't the cost that we paid. It's the cost at which we're selling it to the customer. So you use your G703 to help you determine what that cost is. It had spots to put in the recycled content, spots to put in you know, the location, spots that we didn't use because again, we weren't rapidly renewable or wood. You know, here we see who the consultant was that's still using this old form. And you would have this form that you're filling out for all of our major materials, right? Now, do any of you, I'm just curious, because again, do you, any of you get requests or pushback to really like get down to the granule? Like someone comes to you and says like, hey, what about your lead data on your door hardware? Has anyone had anyone get down to that point and ask? Or are what you're seeing today is most of the requests are focusing around the glass, the metal, panels, just the really big stuff you're buying out? Yeah, I have seen me, it. I have seen it down to the nitty gritty, like as hardware and everything. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Paul, was that recently or was that a while back? No, I, th I think that was on PCMB. I had to go to Elena. She had to go to some of the manufacturers and and, and get their lead da data from them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's it's rare. Um, I mean, I'm with Paul. Like, I I had one time that that came up that they wanted to to get down to that level. Um, and in general, I think that it's cases like that, it's when they're really close. Because again, when we were looking at those percentages, you know, they're looking at 20% of cost or 40% of cost being what they need to kick over, right? And as, long, as, soon as, as soon as they have documentation, they know what their total cost is. They know what the building is costing them. As soon as they have the documentation that they're over that 20% range, they're good. Like they don't need any more. Or if they're you know, over the 40% range, again, they're good, they don't need any more. I think what we see is those rare cases where they're coming in and they're like at 38% and they're trying to see what they can do to eke out a couple extra percentages. And that's when they start really like digging in and wanting to get to that really granular level. Here we can see the form they wanted uh, Mike to fill out for our products. Um, again, he's just listed his 795 and 983. Did not list his primer. I mean, technically, if we really want to comply, we should list out the primers. And the primers do work today. Like, we don't have an issue with them exceeding VOCs, but um, most of the time we are using primer. So this is that environmental product declaration that I was telling you about. So when, have any of you seen this document before or gotten it recently when you're submitting? I'm seeing nods, yeah. yeah. So this is that product that now, this document that helps us with getting that, helps them really get that point for having you know, a lot of materials on their building have these environmental product declarations. It's, they've paid UL, all right, so now, you know, so now we got the Green Building Council making money, UL's making money, the consultants are making money, everyone's making money, yeah. Uh, you know, UL sits down and does this whole life cycle analysis on aluminum. Uh, we won't read through this thing. It is pretty interesting. Um, if you took a look at it, it gives technical data on what the material is, what standards it follows. There's a really cool drawing in here that shows like the actual process, like how do we actually make extrusions? 
you know, and then how do we ultimately take those extrusions and put them together via either pour into bridge or in our case, the isolator, you know, and then it gets into how they're packaged. It's a document that talks about, again, what they call uh, cradle to gate. So in this case, this is their cradle to gate walking through the whole process of what happens with aluminum, you know, from the raw, you know, raw material supply, transport to the manufacturer, manufacturing, transport to the building site, installation into building, use, maintain, repair, you know, and then even to the point of after that point, then replacing it. And when, then could it be refurbished, you know, operational energy uses, water use, you know, gets this whole thing and finally to like disposal or the eventual reuse, recovery and recycling. So when we submit this document, this is helping them get that point for um, doing um, the environmental uh, product declarations. Now, it's important that you note this though, because like, let's look at another example of a submittal. I thought I, hold on. Yeah, I think it's this one. So this is ver version, uh, lead version four that we talked about. So this is technically the one that we are under now. And you can see the request now looks different. It's not broken up around credits four, five, six, and seven. It's broken up now based upon how they're now doing the credits. The BBDO EPD, Environmental Product Declaration. I'm looking at extrusions. We check no, we don't have one. We do, that's the document we're just looking at. You wanna say yes, and it's a generic industry-wide because that's what who made that document. It's not specific to Western. It was made by the United States Extruders Association. So we want to go ahead and say yes. So our customer is aware that yes, we are helping you contribute to getting this point. <clears throat> then it gets down into more of our typical stuff that we saw of listing out what those actual percentages are. Um, and again, the only ones that we're doing is a recycled content. If you had a rare case that you had something that truly was coming within 100 miles, you would list it, but we don't have a take back program. We're not wood or any of those other thing. Uh, and we wouldn't apply to any of these either. So the key here, just make sure for aluminum only, for aluminum only, yes, we are giving them that product declaration, but it is a generic industry wide one. Um, to date, we don't have anything for glass or any of the others. So at that point, we've gone through everything. I'd like to open it up to any questions that anyone may have. Just to follow up on the extrusions, there is two separate reports, one for the extrusions and then one for the actual thermal break. So if you have thermal breaks on your project, you wanna make sure you grab both of those and they are posted on the wiki um, under the glass division and the purchasing section. And then there's a section for extru extruders. Uh, there's a lead section that has both of those forms posted. Okay, good. Yeah, so make sure you're grabbing those. Um, you know, if you have materials, I mean, I don't know if most of you are going directly uh, to your vendors to get any documentation or if you're using purchasing. Um, I'm speaking to Heather. I mean, purchasing is there to be able to help you with those things and gather them. And oftentimes they may already have the documentation so that can save you a step. Any other questions? Hey Vince, did, uh, did Michael have to fill this form out? Cause most often we don't have to actually fill out the forms and I've never seen it like this. I've seen it in just like an Excel spreadsheet that you in, input some very specific numbers and then it calculates the rest of it for you. And we don't usually do a lot of any calculating. It should be on an automated. Yes, no, I agree. So I, I, when I talked to Mike, um, and because he'd been doing a lot of these lately, I said, hey, can you give me a range? Like what, what was like one of the really easy ones you've had? And what was one of the hardest ones you've had yet? So this one that we're looking at, he said was one of his hardest ones. Now, I don't know if that is because this is version uh, four. And that as we see more of, of these, that they are going to look like this. Or, you know, if still we'll see most being simpler like that. But he definitely said, hey, here's UCI. This one was super clean cut, easy. I put it in, it 
easy to fill out. This one, he said, was more challenging. And yes, he was actually filling out um, this information. So, so Vince, funny how there's like no consistency at all across the board. Like everyone has a different type of lead form. Well, and again, again, going back to this whole thing is a giant money making scheme to make people money. Um, it, that's the consultants, right? So, I mean, you choose to have a building that has lead or you're forced to have a building that has lead because of what the area that you're building in, you know, and you end up, no one wants to like just go down this road on their own. Even the GCs that have, um, you know, lead accredited professionals in their employ, I don't think are necessarily totally doing it on their own. You know, they're usually hiring a consultant or have someone else that kind of helps on the process and go through everything. And so that's where I think you get those differences. Like each one of them has just developed their different set of tools all the time. Because what you actually get out of um, lead themselves is really minimal. Like they don't put together these forms. None of these forms are generated by lead. Um, they're all being generated by the end users who ultimately have to submit it. Nick, did you have something? I was just gonna say like, I've done it on three projects. Nick, you just muted. All right, I've done it on three projects and I think there's been a consultant on every one. And it's, you know, it's kind of daunting in the beginning because you're like, I don't understand half this stuff. But I've noticed that once you get them the info they've requested, there's not much after, at least for the ones I've done. Yeah. It hasn't been really, de I don't know, maybe it gets detailed on their side, but. Um, I think it's much more detailed on their side, right? I mean, it goes back to the list that we were looking at, just how many credits there are, right? Because you think about it. <clears throat> we're contributing to basically two or three possible things and we're submitting data on just those two or three. They've got to get the data and on all, you know, again, if they're going for all the points, maybe they're not going for all the points or they know what they're going to try to achieve. They've got a lot of things. So I think it is daunting on their end. It's yeah. certainly not an easy process. Yeah, just in terms of like the amount of things on a, at a GC level, architect level, owner level that they've got to pull together. So, you know, our part is, is that relatively small and yeah it's like i think like anything it's a little bit of riding a bike right the first time you go through the process it looks really daunting what are you doing but i mean once you get a couple of these under your belt it's usually pretty smooth and then it's only when you do get those rare cases that someone wants to be like hey what about your door hardware you know that you're really having to like dig into it but those are definitely the exception rather than the rule Any other questions, comments? You seem a little jaded. Yes, do I? Good, that's exactly how I wanted that to come across. That's perfect. No, I mean, guys, like I said, I mean, when you, I'm, I talked about this a little bit in the beginning, they've been doing this for 23 years now. And when they go and actually research these buildings after the fact, they find they don't use any less energy than a non-lead building. Now, is that because non-lead buildings just happen to be built in a way that's the same? I don't know, but like the, this, the, the research studies have shown they're built the same. You know, and again, when they've done um, the same studies on occupant uh, quality of life, they're fine, they're just as happy in a non-lead building as they are in a lead building. Or maybe they're just as unhappy. I don't know, it's, you know, it's like what, kind of day they wake up on. You know, another major criticism of LEED is that it really focuses a, a lot on what's going on at the site, right? Like it cares about, you know, what's happening at the site, what products are going into the site. Um, it doesn't care about the whole stream so much. Like there's a couple things like, ooh, if you can get within 100 miles, that's great. But once you outside of 100 miles, it doesn't care if you source those materials from 200 miles away or from halfway around the world, right? And it doesn't care that those materials you sourced from halfway around the world, they were clubbing baby seals while making them. Like, I don't know why you would club baby seals while you make them, but they don't care. Like, you know what I mean? So there's a lot of criticism at it that it's just very site centric. It's just a splashy thing about that building. But if we're really trying to be environmentally responsible, it's not covering 
the entire value chain that goes into building well, that. Well, yeah, exactly like you just said. One thing, I've been on projects in LEED where teams have spent months to try to figure out the best glass to use to, to increment like, like a, a, a percentage of a point made a difference to them. And I even on one of the buildings I did at UCSF, they are, every one of them is big into lead. We spent months on this one elevation to try to make it use, uh, very comfortable for all of the end users. And yet at the end of the day, when the project's done and like a year later, they realized all this glass they put in, all this uh, exterior facade shading they did, every single person on this elevation was pulling their shades down. Right. So it, it yes. really didn't make any difference in the end. No, exactly. No, that's exactly it, right? I mean, that's what we're talking about. That like they go into all this design, spend all this time in design. And I've had projects like that too. Design it where it's meant to be this big open space and you have all these views and everyone loves it. And you actually go and everyone's drawn their blinds because yeah. they, they don't actually like the amount of light that comes through in that openness. So um, yeah, I mean, those are, those are the criticisms, right? I mean, and so I told you in the beginning, I give you some personal opinions and maybe we can say that's being jaded, but it is something that still is very relevant and we still have to do it you know and we'll see where it goes from here there are some alternative uh green building um certifications out there besides lead lead has certainly been the most prevalent and really took hold um but there are some that try to look more at the whole stream and try to limit a little more what types of products can be used right because it would be really nice if you said hey I actually do give value if you source your material from a company that they themselves are a net zero company, right? That if we were able to show, hey, as Walters and Wolf, all of our facilities are net zero. Like we generate all of our own power. We generate all of our own electricity and you're sourcing materials from companies like that and get credit for it. We're just not, not there yet. So that's, those are the criticisms, those are the challenges but a lot of people still making a lot of money from this. Any others? Nice work. Yeah, that was a good presentation, Vince. Very oh, good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. A lot. Good, yes, and if I'm, any of you have any questions after I'm this. I'm glad you're jaded, because even though I, I uh, re-up my certification every two years, I'm jaded when I do it. <laughs> No, and like I said, you know, mentioned, that's why I didn't do it and didn't go through the process, um, you know, because I was, I got into LEED and started studying it probably back in 2007 or 2008. Um, and, and when I started, it really was for the goal of eventually taking the test and, and becoming a LEED AP and, and doing all that. And when I started getting into it, I realized, oh, if I really do this, like, I'm really doing it just to put a title after my name. I'm not actually getting anything that's truly practical. Like, cause I can read all of it and study it and I have the book and I can look at all this stuff. I just don't have the title. So that was just a personal choice for me. Today, if you want to, the lowest level is a green associate. It's $200 and you take a uh, 100 question multiple choice test. And if, so, if you were, wanted to study and read what all these um, credits are, so you could take it and you could say, Green they made that simpler when Candace and I did it. I think it was over 200 questions and it was four hours long. It was no, so, so the three levels, I mean, because we've got a couple minutes here, we can wrap up with this. So the lowest level of being accredited as a person now is the green associate, which I, when, when Candace, you and, you and Paul went through, I, I don't think those were available because I think you guys did it. Not no, too they long are. No, they were. Oh, they, they were? were? Okay. Yeah. So the green associate, it requires no experience. Like someone, uh, like an 18 year old out of high school could, could sit for the test. Hey, know? now wait a second, wait a second. Some of this is really hard. <laughs> well, I'm just saying if they studied, they'd be able to, to do it. It requires no experience. Um, they, you just have to take the test. It's a hundred questions and you can become a green associate. You do have to re-up every two years. Zero percent related to our industry. So you do have to know, a, you've got to guess really well <laughs> uh, a lot of, that's it um, exactly yeah well or you study a lot right or you do a lot of studying so the next level is that lead ap now it's called with a specialty <clears throat> that is a 200 point or 200 question test 100 of them being the same as a green associate 100 of them being whatever specialty you're choosing 
and again, you have to send them money every two years to renew and re-up and keep doing it. And finally, you have the lead fellows. Lead fellows have 10 years of experience. Or I should say the lead APs, you need three years of experience. The lead fellows, you need 10 years of experience and you have to be nominated by one of your peers. It's like getting a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Like, you know, and I'm, <laughs> I'm sure there's money passing hands on that one too. So oh, Vince, Vince, you know, Vince, I will be honored for you to nominate too. me as a fellow. <laughs> Paul, we totally can do that. I let me. I, after this, I may text you my Venmo. Um, and <laughs> we can certainly see what we can do. Oh, Greg, Greg, do you have something? No, I was going to say you, you, hit a, you hit a sore spot with these two. You know, they're the only ones that come they can't be certified. They, they're so proud of themselves. Now you hurt. You hurt their feelings now. Yeah, you know, I'm on board with Vince with it. You brought me way down. All right. <laughs> Well, it's too much fun to be having on a Thursday afternoon, that's for sure. Good stuff. Thank you. All right. Thanks, thanks lot, everyone. Vince. Have a fantastic right. day. I hope to see you all very soon. See ya. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Good job. See ya. Bye. Good job. Bye.